Welcome to Ian, friends. I am Ian, Ed, Ian Dilley, uh, senior editor of Flow Bikes. And I am Michael Sheehan, Ian's friend. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. And uh, happy birthday, Michael. Ah, cheers. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've got an exciting show for you guys today. We're going to start out with a national cyclocross champion, Stephen Hyde. We're going to be talking to him about his off season, how it's going, um, his, uh, I guess it's not actually his off season. He is going to be pursuing a full mountain bike racing campaign this summer and then transitioning back into cyclocross. So we're going to talk with him about that. Um, we are also going to be talking about uh, Matej Mechorek and his ridiculous win on Sunday in Italy uh, using his patented move, the Super Tuck. And we'll be talking about your article, Michael, uh, about domestic racing and the rise of pro continental teams in the U.S. this year. Yeah, exciting times. And so, yeah, cyclocross is over. We're done talking about that. And there's this guy, Wout Van Aert. <laughs> 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 Never we were, heard of him. Who we would actually like to talk about a little bit. He, uh, man, he had two really good rides recently. He's now road racing instead of cyclocross racing, the world champion. And Strada Bianchi, holy cow, he podium in, I think, his first world tour race ever. And we saw him have some dark moments on the final climb. I think we're going to pull up a clip yeah, let's of see. the uh, finishing climb of Strada Bianchi. And yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, thank God for uh, camera phones. Otherwise, we would have never seen this. But it's, it's, we had the bunny hop herd around the world, and now we have the cramp herd around the world. Um, this is painful and beautiful to watch in so many ways for me. Yeah, he, it, it's hard to watch, but you, you have to appreciate, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen a guy go that deep in a bike race before, and I, I wouldn't want to try to hold on to Roman Bartes <laughs> yeah. a little after that. I mean, why does coming off of racing for 60 to 70 minute, like really high intense cyclocross races, and all of a sudden, Strada Bianchi is like, it's almost a classic, like full length road race. He's in a breakaway up the road with Tour de France contender Roman Bardet. I cannot think of really two different riders. So I think we're going to talk to Stephen Hyde a little bit about just his take knowing Wout and his preparations yeah, for let's, that race. Yeah, let's, uh, let's bring Stephen in here. Um, we've got him coming to us from Spain. Hi, guys. Hey Steven, thanks for being with us. And uh, yeah, did I did you watch uh, Strade Bianchi? Are you familiar with uh, what happened to your uh, friend and, and training partner uh, Wout Van Aert there in Italy over the weekend? Oh, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, me and uh, everyone here at the house that uh, I'm staying at in Malaga uh, sat around and watched the race, <clears throat> did our rides in the morning, and then came back just in time to see all the uh, the good action it was awesome it was it was, uh, it was great room for him and what was your impression i mean were you expecting a ride like that of him did you you know you you did a training camp with him in calpe did you have a sense that he could handle i mean we all knew he could handle the gravel roads obviously but um you know doing almost you know, five hours on gravel roads uh with with the climbs that they were doing did you have a sense that he was capable of that type of performance yeah i mean absolutely i mean you look at the way the guy has kind of uh tailored his cross program to be able to race these classic races and um really had an eye for it took a couple of little breaks during the season and kind of you know didn't race as many races as a lot of other people were doing so um you know he did put a lot of preparation into it, it was kind of an odd way of, you know an odd season for him but uh i think he really had his his eye on not just worlds, but starting really fresh with the uh, um, Grand Tour season and or the, uh, the classic season. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> those first couple of races this year, uh, you know, at, <laughs> at Newsblad and stuff like that. I mean, he was all there, and um, just takes a few races to really like <laughs> get it together. And man, he he put it together there for sure. So. Uh, what was training with him like when you were in Spain? Uh, could you give us kind of an idea of just like the hours you were putting in? Was it just like a half wheeling all day, every day 
affair? <laughs> what, what was it? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't let uh, I didn't let him half wheel me. I have a little too much pride. But, um, sure. <laughs> it uh, yeah, it was pretty tough. I mean, you know, I kind of wiped my uh, training off the books and was just like, okay, all right, let's let's just um, let's just do the program and, and see what it's like. And you know, if I got to pull the plug, I got to pull the plug, and that's fine. But it was uh, it was difficult, but um, I could certainly do it, and it really pushed me. Yeah. I, you know, push me in my training. It's not something, uh, you know, when I do by myself, you kind of settle in to kind of the same routine and you, you give yourself a little bit of leeway um, to get pushed. But, you know, when you have somebody so strong that's just there to to really make an impression after that camp, um, it, it really worked out for me. I mean, it was definitely some hard days. We were doing a lot of like four and a half, five hour days in a row and um, some real intensity as well. It was also really, really good for me to pace myself uh, on some of those intensity efforts, on some of those VO2 efforts and such, um, and just see where, where I stack up, and, and not just in um, in actual power, but in, in draining. Like, okay, am I going too hard? Am I, am I going hard enough? My assumption was I wasn't going hard enough, but the reality is I think I could even back off a little bit, so <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> and so how does the training that y'all did and that um, – did Wout do anything particularly different from what you and the other top cross racers are doing? Like, did you see him building up for a classics campaign? Is he riding, was he riding more? Like, how do you kind of compromise trying to win cross world championships, which he did, and then go and do this in the road classic season? Is it just totally new uncharted territory or what's your take on that? No, it's not necessarily. Um, Steve Bar did it for a long time. Um, mm. Boom did it. Uh, you know, it's it's definitely doable. Um, it's not uh, a traditional route, but uh, you know, it's all volume, really. It's it's about taking those little breaks um, in mid season, which traditionally, you know, you didn't see. You know, six years ago, you didn't see uh, the Belgians or whoever the Dutch going to Spain for multiple periods throughout the winter. But now you're starting to see. Um, guys jumping on cheap flights and coming out to to Calpe or or uh, you know wherever and, and doing a short week or four day training block and then jumping back into some races, uh, getting that volume in mid season and in those little breaks is is really crucial and it can help uh, the, you know that kind of shoulder season. You can help you really like jump into uh, the amount of training you have to do to do those five four hour long races. I mean, going from a, a 60, 70 minute race to a, a four hour race or five hour race is no joke. So you really have to put in a lot of volume in the in the season, and you know it's difficult to have a lot of that snap and a lot of that acceleration for cyclocross. A lot of that VO two stuff when when you're actually doing all that volume. I mean, it kind of in sometimes you just ride it out of your legs. So you kind of saw it with the season. It was real up and down and up and down, and then put it down when it mattered that world you know the course really suited him and he was certainly fit for it yeah i mean that <clears throat> that sort of leads to a, a theory that i had when i was watching worlds was that you know wout did write off some of those um cycle cross races even some of the world cups uh later in the season because he <laughs> had his eye on the road classics and uh, do you think that's accurate that, you know, um, he really geared his season around Worlds and then transitioning into uh, into this classic season? And, I mean, let's 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 face it, he's a he's always wanted to win Paris-Roubaix, and now he's a true contender for this race. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't win every single race you go into, right? So you have to, to pick and choose those things. And he's so young, but he's also really, really focused, and I think he has a really good head on his shoulders. So he's able to which a lot of people aren't, uh, to let a few races go and say, like, okay, I'm not going to be good at these races, and that's totally fine because I have uh, an overall, an overreaching goal, <clears throat> and it worked out. It's it's pretty impressive, honestly. I mean, it really made me kind of look at my training and go, like, okay, I can do a little more than I think I can if I just want to do it. And Yeah, I think it's really neat. Cool. And, um, yeah, let's talk about your racing. Uh, you're transitioning into mountain bike racing. You've got your, your first uh, mountain bike race coming up uh, here soon in Utah. Can you tell us a little bit about what your um, mountain bike race schedule looks like and, and what your ambitions are for uh, mountain bike racing this season? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this season will be pretty cool. Uh, last 
last season was my first pro season on the mountain bike circuit. Um, it's been a long time. It's what I started with and, uh, briefly, but I did start with it and I loved it. I always loved it. And, um, I just kind of found my way into the professional ranks via racing and, and cyclocross. So, um, I kind of took a hiatus from it and, um, I, I've always ridden mountain bikes on the side and I've always said, man, I really wish I could, <laughs> why am I not racing mountain bikes? I really wish I was. And, um, I got the opportunity to do so. And so last year I did a pretty short season some local races and some some UCI races just to get my feet wet again and and I had so much fun doing it and we had good success doing it um so we with the 2020 Olympics in mind um brought in Kendale as uh, more of a big time sponsor and we, we rolled it into um the cyclocross world program so as far as I know we're the first cyclocross program in the U.S. to be a year-round program now um even though it's just me on there um you know, it's not a road team sporting or a mountain bike team sporting a cyclocross rider. It's a cyclocross team actually supporting a mountain bike rider, which I find just really, really cool. Um, we'll have a 13 race program starting in uh, Utah with the uh, Soldiers Hollow race. Uh, we'll be ending up at Mount St. Anne, hopefully. Um, that'll be my first World Cup and my kind of bid into the World Cup season for next year. So it, it'll be a really, really cool um race calendar for me, some Canada Cup races, some Pro XCTs. Um, we'll even do some, like, New England uh, UCI racing at, like, uh, the Jewel Bow Green Mountain race. Um, I am really, really looking forward to it, to, to be under that Cyclocross World umbrella still and uh, have all those comforts that I normally have, have my same mechanic, Gary Wolf, have, you know, Stu Thorne backing me up and have Cannondale and all of our same sponsors. It's It's a really, really unique opportunity for me and I'm really excited to get on with it. Cool. Well, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, watching you race mountain bikes and uh, following you into the 2018 cyclocross season. And cheers. Uh, thanks for being here with us. Cheers, and uh, Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to you soon, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you so much for having me, guys. <laughs> Bye. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Um, well, I, I think all our uh, theories were confirmed. Uh, yeah, Steven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we, we're just nailing it. We're pretty smart. That's all I have to say, <laughs> but, but yeah, thanks a lot yeah. for Stephen Hyde being with us, and um, yeah, it's going to be exciting to follow him. Uh, what do we have up next? Uh, super exciting race this weekend, uh, Sunday, the Industria e Artigianto in Italy. This is uh, part of the Ciclismo Cup Series, and it was an interesting race. It was a mix of um, sort of continental teams, world tour teams, uh, really difficult parkours, uh, classic Italian racing. Yeah, and what well, we saw, the, the one who really stole the show, uh, Matte Mahoric, he pulled out his just signature move. We, he's the guy who has been pretty much credited with inventing the super tuck, which you know, popularized by Chris Froome, like on his top two pedaling. <laughs> I like it. To, I like to call it the "Don't try this at home" super tuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to put it. So yeah, <laughs> Mohoric, he started it like this whole trend essentially, top two pedaling at U23 Worlds back in 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. And he has actually won quite a few races. Yeah, well, he won this Sunday. Right. We have a clip here. We can go to that of uh, they get to the top of this climb. And he's just railing the descent. They get down to the flatter section, and where you know where most riders would get out of their tuck, and he just stays in his tuck and keeps pedaling and keeps pedaling away from everybody. Um, there's uh, one poor gentleman that nearly catches him at the end. He holds him off, but um, yeah, but like uh, watching uh, Mahoric do the super tuck, his classic move. I mean, it's almost like a, a video game, like finish them move. He goes to the super tuck <laughs> on the final descent. <laughs> And no, no one can catch him. It's it's unstoppable. Yeah, he he rode away from a breakaway with like eight-ish people uh, with 5k to go, and it was just all downhill. So, you know, obviously a very very fast, effective move. And I don't know if he just somehow is anatomically gifted enough to be able to put down a whole lot of power when he's in that little fast position. Because I don't think ever, not everybody can do it. Have but you ever tried it? I have. It's, it's genuinely fast, but he's also <laughs> kind of doing it. Like, I'll do it if I'm down, like, a really steep, I don't know, more than 10% grade. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, apart from that, I don't know. But you see it on Mahork's doing it down like a 4% grade. Right. He, he did it in the criterion w that I was in in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that, Michael. <laughs> he, he went up the road in a breakaway. It was like w one of those, uh, like eight guys got away in a breakaway. The Euro teams that were there, like Lamprey was there, Green Edge, they kind of shut down the race on the narrow part of the course and like gave the breakaway, like basically they were going to win it. So there's a hot dog section where we're going down a highway and you can see the breakaway coming back on the other side of the road as we're going through it. And the road just like dips down underneath a bridge and dips back up like super mellow, like 500 meter section at like 4% grade. And <laughs> Mahorik's just like every lap we see him coming back down that stupid little grade under the bridge <laughs> on his top tube pedaling. <laughs> it's like every lap there's just like one less person with him. <laughs> Until there's just like one person left in the breakaway with him. He lapped the field twice oh and, and won. He, so yeah, Mohorek not only wins mountain races top tube pedaling, but crits yeah. in Hong Kong. Yeah. So it, it's his move and it's working. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, every time he goes to it, I, I, the, I get goosebumps on the back of my neck. It's uh, pretty exciting to watch. And, you know, he's, a, I mean, I think maybe uh, Chris Froome should thank him for, you know, adopting his move and then winning the Tour de France. If, uh, if Chris uh, Froome owes anybody for his Tour de France win. Uh, and yeah, I, I think and ultimately it does come down to Mahorik. <laughs> Made possible by Matej Mahorik. <laughs> um... So you wrote a wonderful story for us last week. Uh, you and I had been talking about how there was really um, a, a shift in the domestic peloton this year. You know, we've always had one, maybe two professional continental teams, but there was always a feeling, why do these teams exist in the U.S.? Um, there wasn't really enough large UCI racing to um, justify their existence, and you know we and they weren't doing big European programs, so mm -hmm. there wasn't really a place for them. Along comes the Tour of California, becomes a world tour race, and suddenly it doesn't make sense to be a domestic team, you know, a, a continental team, a, a third division professional team in the U.S. anymore. So, uh, you know, I, I really liked how your article, and uh, go to the website and read it if you haven't already, um, touched on how the Tour of California in a trickle-down effect type way is, you know, raising the level of professional racing across the U.S. Um, you know, the big question we had was, can the U.S. sustain this? We don't really have the racing in the U.S. to sustain, what do we have now, yeah, five yeah, pro-continental teams? We have teams. five pro-continental teams right now, which is, it's huge for American cycling. That's uh, more than, more pro county teams than any other country. And right. traditionally, we see all the pro county teams I, I would say, I can't pull out the exact number, but I think uh, like over 80% of all pro county teams are based in Europe. And that's just because they have access to European World Tour races and the higher uh, UCI races. So they're trying to get wild card entries into Grand Tours, Classics, blah, blah, blah. In America, there's no financial incentive to be a pro county team unless you're going to Europe, which is just like, requires a way, way bigger budget. So now that Tour California is a world tour race, and we had Pat McCarty, director of Rally, kind of contribute to this article and give me his, some of his thoughts, he said it really poignantly that American teams live and die by inclusion in the Tour of California. Yeah, and I mean, from your perspective, being on Jelly Belly, which was a perennial at the Tour of California for years, um, what was it like? being on a team and, you know, around this type of year, late February, early March, when the Tour of California is making its team selections, what's the level of tension and anxiety in an American-based professional team waiting on that Tour of California invite? It is, like, the tension is palpable, and typically California announces it, uh, what domestic teams it's inviting around April, but I would go to my early season training camp in California every February, and you can kind of tell it's on everybody's mind. <laughs> and, and both years, Danny, our director, it would be the first or second night of camp. We'd, he'd just like be in the middle of a sentence and then like blurt out, oh, we got into Tour California. <laughs> oh, sh shit, I wasn't supposed to say that. But like you, you could tell he, like that is just like everything that's basically ensuring that the team right. is going to exist for another year. It's yeah. like we are on that biggest stage and giving our sponsors the biggest bang for their buck marketing wise because yeah everybody's going to see Jelly Belly on NBC. So, yeah, it's huge. And uh, with five pro county teams in America right now, it's 
pretty much they're all vying for spots at Tour California. And the article just discusses, you know, what happens if a team has made this huge financial commitment to go pro Cani and they don't get an invite because it's not guaranteed. Uh, is America going to have the UCI races? Is there like a robust enough calendar to right. support this right. financial commitment that the teams have made? Right. And yeah. It's yeah, we're really going to have to see if uh, the rest of domestic racing can sort of rise to that level right beneath the, the two of California. Are we going to get more, you know, UCI 1.8 HC races, UCI 1.1 races that can sustain a, a more robust domestic calendar? Yeah, so we'll see. You know, uh, we have a couple clips from teams that didn't make the uh, uh, selection into Tour California last year. You can see how important it is. And that's one thing I really want to tip my hats to. Like we had the reaction from Action and Hincapie, who didn't make the invitation last year, but they like doubled down, got more sponsorship this year, and yeah, have more money, and they're definitely vying for it. Action, you know, has said in an article recently that they are very focused on getting the invite. So, right now, this time of year, I think that there's probably a lot of like back channel communication between these teams and Amgen trying to just figure out what it's going to take to get in. Yeah, yeah, we saw Action last year started a, a petition in order to get into the, the Tour of California. That's how important it was to them. And, um, you know, uh, just quickly, we're, we're about to wrap up, but the um, one thing that I found interesting is that the Tour of California doesn't necessarily have clear selection criteria in terms of uh, these are the results you need to achieve to get an invite to this race. And I was talking with Gavin Mannion about that, who races for UHC, mm. one of the mm -hmm. top domestic racers. And, um, you know, he really felt like in some ways that was in benefit to the teams because if they have to meet certain performance standards, especially earlier in the year, then they blow themselves out just trying to meet those standards and they're, they're not ready for the Tour of California. You know, they focused on just making the Tour of California and by the time they get there, uh, they're not they're not ready to perform. So, um, you know, he was saying it's actually better if, you know, the teams are selected. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a subjective manner, but you know, um, there's not a clear defined path to get there. And that's something we saw work in Rally's benefit last year, right, mm -hmm. where they showed up specifically ready to perform at the Tour of California and and won two races. So. Um, yeah, there, it, there's a lot of interesting dynamics there, but I, you know, I think at the end of the day, we all think this is a good thing for American cycling. Yeah, yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see how it unfolds over the next couple months. But yeah, exciting times in America. Yeah, well, cool. That wraps up our show. Happy birthday to you! Cheers. And we will see everyone in two weeks. <laughs>